Good morning, everyone. My name is Ralph Bingham. I am the executive director of Library Link NJ. Welcome to our membership meeting today. Good morning. Uh, some housekeeping things. Again, if you could please, as you're coming into the room, mute your microphone. Um, at this point, we'll be talking about our meeting roles uh, later on as part of our business meeting. And um, so we want to be muted, uh, at least initially, for uh, John's presentation today. Um, if you would, it's also helpful to us if you rename yourself in Zoom uh, with your name and your institution. That way, um, when we get to any voting that might need to be done later, that's helpful. So I'll probably repeat that again uh, further on in the program. So uh, moving right along here, uh, you know, again, welcome to everyone. Um, me soon, if we, you could please advance to the next slide. I would just like to introduce uh, our executive board this morning. Um, they're shown here on the slide. Uh, many of them are, I uh, see, or have come in and are present today, but I'm gonna read everyone's name. Uh, we have Philip Berg, Chris Carbone, Rajna Das, Kathy Dempsey, Corey Fleming, Janina Calden, Alan Kleiman, Bonnie Lafazan, Lori Matassa, Ricardo Pino, Jennifer Poldowski, Will Porter, Jenny Poo, our president, and Irene Sterling. Thank you for, to our executive board. Uh, thank you for all of your support these last five months or so. Uh, as you know, I get started in this ride as I guess director. So thank you so much. Um, and I'd also like to introduce our staff. Uh, Misun Liu is here today as our IT support. Darby Malvi is also here, um, our programming and outreach specialist. You'll we'll hear from both of them later. I would also like to recognize Annette Cox, our business manager, and Carol Fishwick, our delivery associate, uh, for the hard work that they do in the office here to keep everything organized. Uh, thank you so much. So that's that's our staff. Um, and again, you're going to be hearing from some of our partners uh, later on as part of the reports in the business meeting. Uh, the partners are listed here. I don't necessarily need to read them all, but many thanks to our partner organizations. We're happy to, you know, be collaborating and partnering with you to uh, serve libraries and library workers in New Jersey. So thank you very much. So I'd like to, you know, get us kicked off with our presentation today um, from John Kraska. Uh, his presentation is sponsored by uh, NJLA uh, and JSOL, the New Jersey Association of School Librarians and LLNJ. We're happy to have uh, John here this morning. Um, John Kraska is co-founder and executive director of Every Library, the only national political action committee for libraries and the Every Library Institute, a public policy and tax policy a think tank for libraries. Since 2012, every library has supported public libraries in numerous funding negotiations with elected officials and on 220 election days to help to secure over $1.8 billion in stable tax money for libraries. The Every Library Institute publishes funding focused research and recently hosted the Library Advocacy and funding conference as a key part of its training agenda. Please join me in welcoming John. Ralph, thank you so much for the chance to be here with the uh, Library Link uh, community. Uh, several of you I've been in, in touch with uh, you know, by email recently, which is fantastic. So many friendly faces, some folks I saw in JSL last week in Atlantic City. Uh, what a treat to be here today. Um, Ralph asked me to come in and chat with you folks about some of the work that we're doing, um, some of the discovery that we're making at every library as we're moving through the work supporting public libraries. Um, 
And the framework for this conversation fundamentally is based in both of our organizations. Um, the Every library side is political action. And we've done some work in New Jersey on, on uh, public library campaigns, a fair amount uh, supporting school librarians across New Jersey as well, uh, not only for the crises that some of them were facing in terms of positions, but also the policy framework that NJSL is trying to advance. Uh, information literacy standards, the, the mandate bill, that, that political action side of things is the equivalent to a doctor, if I can be so bold, because we work on one library at a time. We're in there with a patient, it presents with a certain uh, sort of uh, uh, profile. You gotta work with that patient in particular ways uh, sometimes patiently, uh, in order to, to help move them down the path of the ballot in order to solve some of their problems when it comes to the advocacy framework. Our, our, our C3 side, our Every Library Institute, our, our public policy and text policy think tank side of things, is intended to be, in a certain respect, a public health model. How do we help work on systems, legislation, local ordinances, school library policies, the research uh, components that go into understanding more about how pu the public elected officials, constituents of elected officials think. Um, and between the two of those things, well, I mean, if it's a, if it's a doctor, uh, you can work on one patient's cancer or you can also work on uh, outlawing smoking. So we're bringing, uh, I hope, uh, a new set of insights on how advocacy and activism truly are supposed to work inside the library community. There's a lot of uh, times where libraries, um, library leaders mush together. Now that's a technical term, mush together. The, the advocacy components and the activism components. We're, we're, we're told time and again by trainings that we attend that we're supposed to get active. Isn't that great? Um, and sometimes getting active uh, with a t-shirt or storming the barricades or having signs or whatever might be the wrong mode if you're looking to spend time co-creating through an advocacy campaign as opposed to activism, an advocacy campaign, co-creating a future that's properly funded for our institutions and for the work that we do. I want to share with you some of these concepts around, well, taking apart, teasing apart, advocacy and activism, and also helping to potentially help you frame an understanding of how people, both the public and voters and constituents of elected officials are wired to listen to you. When you talk about, well, you know, they love libraries, but nobody wants to pay for them. All right, let me get into it a little bit with you. We have a theory of advocacy that is different than our theory of activism. And I want to take a few moments and, and spend some time on these because it's important, I think, uh, to be able to understand what we're, we're trying to accomplish in both of these separate modes. Advocacy fundamentally is a process of co-creation. Right now, the funding is wrong or your authority to act as a library is wrong. Uh, something is deficient or defective in terms of your structure, maybe even your building uh, needs to be upgraded. Advocacy focuses on those long-term relationships. It's through a shared values framework, a purposeful alignment of missions, and a common vision for either people that you care about or the place that you call home. Folks, the advocacy conversation is extraordinarily important and has a particular idiom and approach that starts with the idea that your partner in an advocacy co-creation is perhaps, they, they probably haven't been paying attention to libraries the way you, you pay attention to libraries. They, they, they might be, uh, well, you know, I love libraries, uh, Geek the Library, those are great campaigns and yet they expect a very high bar from the people that we're working with. Uh, I'll take rationally ignorant but favorably disposed to libraries any day because you can start with the rationally ignorant conversation and educate and orient them to what you do and what your institution is capable of. The, what you do as librarians and library workers, whether it's in K-12, higher ed, public libraries, systems, uh, the work that you do uh, as your institutions, what the capacities are if you're properly funded, the education and orientation components here are not uh, activism moments. They're not storming the barricades. They're not wearing t-shirts. They're about, okay, let's talk about where our shared values truly are. Because if we are capable and we are interested 
in creating a new future for our community or on our campuses or for our students. Well, the partner across the table from us probably is as well, otherwise we wouldn't be talking with them. Ideation is the next step in a theory of advocacy that is a functional theory of advocacy because it is a conversation about where we would like to go as people who care, either about a population that we serve together or a place we both call home. And then the next step in the process is really one of identification. It, it's an arc, it's a conversation. It's, a, it's an opportunity to say uh, with a advocacy partner, a coalition group who is focused on changing policy or something as substantial as the budget for your town, your county, your, your, your state, even, God help us, the feds, identifying what resources create an authentic collaboration is not something that one advocate, I'm sorry, it's not something that is an, act, an activism campaign. It is a conversation between the folks like yourself who run society. And then finally, in, in an arc of advocacy, where there is a co-creation, it's, um, it's not an adversarial situation. We're, we're not trying to get somebody, we're, not, we're also not storytelling, by the way. Uh, this isn't a storytelling opportunity. This is us taking a look together where we commit resources. We commit, um, well, we, we, we commit our people, we, we commit our time, we, we commit our budgets, in order to solve problems together. I'm belaboring the point a little bit here because advocacy as a unit of, of activity and a event horizon is substantially different than what activism is. And I, I, I am asking the entire library sector, public libraries, school libraries, academic libraries, to start pulling these two things apart. Because activism, as opposed to advocacy, is a different milieu. And it's one that we need to take very seriously, because it is about the very short timeline. It is about short and frequent focused activities that are, again, driven by value system, but it's more about the personal identification. It's, it's about the kind of folks who are, who are not looking to see things get screwed up more. It's seizing an opportunity, like, hey, we've got a good bill happening right now in Trenton. We have a, a, a heck of an opportunity in Congress. If we can just talk to city council or our school board uh, as if they were adults, we can get something done and seize this opportunity. And the type of people who show up for activism to seize opportunities are fundamentally and substantially different than the kind of people who are with you for a long-term advocacy co-creation conversation. Nothing wrong with activists, though. I love them. Hey, let's seize an opportunity. There's also the um, conversation that you have with activists where you're trying to either fix or avert impending failure. And the impending failure that brings out an activist is something that is, well, like seizing an opportunity if you're an activist. This affirms our belief system. This is an ideal I can get behind the same way an activist shows up to avert or fix failure is that something has offended their value system. Something has caused them to be upset and they are willing to respond if directed. Activism fundamentally is based on shared values to either affirm or offend belief. And it's because it's based on beliefs and values, it's a shorter conversation and it's extremely directed it is based in a shared identity, of course. Like, what kind of people do we want to be? Why are we going to screw this up again? Why don't we please take care of, let's pass that bill and get this thing done. We are people who together are focused on the other. And the activism campaign has to have integrity. Otherwise, well, behind its motivations and its goals, the integrity of the process has to be there. Otherwise, Activists will, quite frankly, look through it and see that it is not authentic and they will not respond. In fact, they'll walk away at a certain point. Activism, unlike advocacy, advocacy co-creates. We want to imagine a new future together where there's funding in place or authority to act. We co-create with us. Activism assumes something, which is that we 
as the ones who are paying really close attention are asking you, the potential activist, to do something specific and quickly. We'll direct your activity because we know activists, I love activists, but they aren't paying a great deal of attention. They're not with us a, a whole lot, but they believe very firmly and they will listen to the integrity that we have and they will respond. But we have to take the bold step of telling them, please act now in this particular way and we will then, well, nudge the asteroid and it will not obliterate our library. Activism also is focused on organizing supporters. There's a whole process for identifying, cultivating, and empowering people that we know works. I mean, at this point, every library's got about a quarter of a million people in our database who have taken some sort of an affirmative action for libraries. We're getting close to 400,000 people on Facebook. Twitter is a whole other matter, it's a dumpster fire, but where we can spend time with folks and actually have that conversation over the long term, give them opportunities to act. Well, the co-creation within advocacy and the fixing failure, averting failure, seizing opportunity within activism is all within our vocabulary. If we understand in a theory of change way where it starts, who it's about, and where it's going over what timeline. All right, that's interesting, I hope to you, because it's fascinating to me. I mean, that's, that's where I do all day long. Let me give you a little bit more insight here into some of the frames around how people, as I said at the beginning, are wired to listen to you, though. Because if you're talking in an advocacy co-creation space or an activism seize opportunity or avert impending catastrophe space, they're going to listen to you in a couple of different ways. And I think it's important that we spend a few moments thinking through how we're messaging about the work we do, the institutions we represent, and our hopes and our concerns as well. All discussions about library funding are political. That's our thesis here at Every Library. It's not just because we have a political action committee and perhaps a public policy tax policy think tank for libraries. It's because you're all funded by taxes. No offense. Taxpayer money, either through the state budget or local appropriations or direct democracy, through schools as public schools, through the university systems as public universities. No offense to everybody who's in a private institution right now, that's totally cool. And there's tremendous amounts of federal and state aid that move in those spaces as well. It's political because it's about taxes and taxes and make Americans crazy. And I want to avoid when my beloved librarians who should be acknowledged as the librarians who are doing transformational, wonderful work in the world, I don't want them to turn into the tax man. But because it is fundamentally a political decision on how we want to tax ourselves. I mean, public libraries only exist for two reasons. One is a progressive tax policy to fund the common good. And two is because we can lend things, you know, first sale. That's a whole other conversation, by the way, about uh, eBooks and, uh, and, and databases and stuff that we need to be having. But lending, you know what I'm talking about. But the progressive tax policy to fund the common good, and therefore, is the budget of your town, is the budget of your state, is the budget of your school district, is the budget that your regents put together, you know, a reflection of your value system where the library is enabled and the librarians and library workers are empowered. There are three narratives that people will listen to you. Oh, there's four, but one of them is the burn it all down narrative. And I'm not gonna really entertain that very much right now. That's a present narrative in American politics and something that we have to fight against. There's not a compromise or a messaging environment around burn it all down. It's, we're seeing it happening in some schools right now in New Jersey, where Burn It All Down comes in and says, we're gonna go against the librarians, uh, the school librarians, uh, in order to make political points and build political power. What I'm talking about here is three normal narratives. Now, if you're a progressive, a conservative, or a libertarian yourselves, uh, hang with me for a few minutes here, because this is where people, again, are wired to listen about the conversations you're trying to have and the stories we like to tell ourselves. The theory here, theory, um, political theory here is from a book called uh, The Three Languages of Politics by a fellow named Arnold Kling. Uh, Mr. Kling is a fellow at the Libertarian Cato Institute. If you're into politics, I would highly encourage you to pick up a copy of this. I think it's a free ebook. Um, the, don't, read it for, don't read it before bed. 
even if you're into politics, because it'll make you a little crazy, because he's right, I think. The narratives around progressive, conservative, and libertarian that he's talking about here, we see playing out time and time and again, up and down the turnpike uh, across the country. That the hero stories, that each political perspective, including the burn it all down folks, by the way, they have hero stories about themselves. We all have hero stories about themselves. And we also have, in effect, villain stories about people. All right, progressive hero stories, according to Mr. Kling, are that they, the progressive ideology, the progressive idiom in politics is that the heroes are those people who have stood up for underprivileged folks. The, the, they're, they're, they stand up and they take care of. It, it's a hand up, of course, instead of a hand out, but the people that are progressive cannot stand are people who are indifferent to the oppression, women, minorities, the poor, the, the, the oppressive behaviors of government, the oppressive attitudes on the part of other populations, progressives. This narrative is how people in a progressive space are wired to listen when you start talking about taxes. How are we gonna put them to work to, to solve problems in our communities? How are we gonna do work that as policy in our libraries, our school libraries, our public libraries, our academic libraries, lets people have more access? On a conservative space, conservative uh, political conversations are wired to idealize Hero, put hero mythology behind people who have stood up for these Western values, at least according to Mr. Kling. And that the people a conservative cannot stand politically are those who are indifferent to the assault on moral virtues and traditions that are part of the foundation of our civilization. Folks, we see this being used perniciously and we see it grabbed by the groups who want to burn the whole place down. And they do leverage this conservative conversation, but fundamentally, the hero and the villain mythology in a conservative mindset has been extraordinarily comfortable with funding libraries for the last 150 years. And how do we get back to a conversation where the, the nature of our work as conservators of society, our society, our campus, our community, uh, is rooted in something that we can have a common conversation about? The third conversation, aside from the burn it all down folks, of course, is the uh, libertarian perspective where there's a hero conversation going on about people who have stood up for individual rights. The individual rights that people have without government overreach because the villain narrative in a, in a libertarian political space, the people they cannot stand are the people who are indifferent to the government taking away people's ability to make their own choices. And again, libraries, Yes, libraries are perhaps one of the most libertarian. Yeah, we, we joke sometimes about, you know, like the socialist institution that we work at, the library. And yet, how do we use a small amount of smart tax money? How do we maximize the access to a collection that supports the curriculum in K-12 and in higher ed? How do we help lower barriers? The, the, the big thing here across all these, these different narratives is that the core work of libraries, public libraries, school library, even academic libraries, has been supported by all three of these different ideas, ideals, I should say, political ideals. And yet we might be somewhat variant from the, the community that we're serving. Because I know that librarians um, in the main, and this is not me, I think, speaking out of turn here, um, we've looked at the national voter file here at every library. The national voter file is fascinating. If any of you have uh, Experian data or Orange Boy or any of the patron point kinds of stuff or anything from Gale or EBSCO where they're like, hey, here's the demographics of your community. The national voter file is the non-anonymized version of it where you can see everybody's record, all their demographics. Uh, and if you search uh, in the national voter file for the word library or librarian and variations on it in states that have partisan primaries, uh, we found uh, just anecdotally that about 87% of anyone with the word library or librarian attached to their, their record pulls a, a democratic, a Democrat ballot or an independent ballot. And from watching how we talk to each other about our ideals, 
uh, it seems like there's a lot of progressives out in our space. And yet, if you're going to go find free, for example, the progressives want to see us go find free because any Thing that gets in the way of people using the library, uh, if it's if it's fifty cents, if it's a dollar fifty, it chills their ability. To, I mean, are you going to ask people for a library fine, or are they going to be able to put food on the table? A anyone in the libertarian space is already looking at fine free, saying, "Why are you fining me? I'm already paying taxes. Double dip and government overreach. Get your hand out of my pocket. Let's lower barriers to people utilizing what was already being paid for." And on the conservative side, all they want to do is make sure that if you, if you go find free and the, they never re, the person never returns the book, that you're going to at least charge them back for the whole book because the book belongs to the community. Totally possible to have these conversations. And yet, if our teams are not speaking the language that our elected officials and groups of our voters and, our, and their constituents of elected officials are listening through that lens we will trip over our own two feet. Whether it's an advocacy conversation that's a long-term co-creation or an activism sees an opportunity or avert failure campaign. All right, more about how people are wired to listen. I hope this is interesting. I think it's fascinating because when we spend money on trying to reach people across political lines and around different audiences, it's important for us to understand how our messaging will be received in order to make sure that we're, we're, we're framing the message in the right way, with the right kind of calls to action in a way that identifies, cultivates, and empowers our supporters, and it lands with them based on values, a shared mission for their community, and a vision for tomorrow. There are four reasons that people will listen to you. Um, these are mutually exclusive. Um, we're, we've been finding in the main, sure, there are people who have similar characteristics, psychological, emotional, uh, uh, psychographic characteristics, but fundamentally there's four ways to talk about what you do for a living in the institution or program that you're supporting. Some people will be able to listen to you based on compassion. We like telling compassion stories. Compassion stories are awesome. They'll be able to listen to you based on compassion because they have a heart for people for specific people, for populations in general. We wanna make sure that everybody has an opportunity to succeed. We're gonna lower barriers, we're gonna make it possible. We're gonna teach Johnny and, 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 and Jerry how to read. Look at the work that we do, isn't that beautiful in the world? And that's only a small portion of the population. There's a bunch of people who are like, yeah, tell me pride of place, tell me about infrastructure. Tell me about the infrastructure of learning. Tell me about the infrastructure of supporting uh, folks at moments of transition or crisis or the infrastructure. I don't care about the story about one particular person getting a first, next, or best job. Let's have a system in place that supports that in a, in a community or as a pathway to individual discovery on a campus or K-12. Tell me about what we're doing to create interesting places to live, thriving places to live, and prosperous places to live. I don't need a sob story about some kid. And those two different, those are very different conversations. And if we don't have a muscle memory for, for doing both compassion storytelling as well as pride of place storytelling, in fact, in K-12, yes, everybody loves students, except when they're, except because well, sometimes you don't. Sometimes what you want is like go tigers, you know, you, and in, in academia, you have a beautiful, you, you have a pride of place right on, on a sweatshirt. It says college on there. That is as important as a compassion conversation, and we tend to minimize it in libraries. This is true for advocacy. This is true for activism. There's another way that people are wired, which is a data-driven approach. They want to see the numbers before they're going to listen to you about what you're up to, what your hopes are, and what your common concerns are, potentially. They want to see the numbers. They want the inputs, the outputs, and the outcomes. Any storytelling that you do for folks about compassion or pride needs to wait until you tell them what you're trying to do and here's the numbers that prove it. The data shows it and the data is the lens through which they view compassion or pride. The data is the uh, frame in which they find compassion or pride first because unless they can see that it's either working or that you can prove a change to the inputs will generate new outputs and give you different outcomes. Folks, storytelling to these people is data. 
And a lot of them are uh, in positions where they run other parts of society and they want to help co-create outcomes, but they're in a nonprofit organization, they're in government agencies, they're elected officials. We have to be anticipating the storytelling that proves our point, either the positive side of it or the negative side of it. The, the, the fourth frame that people are wired for right now is uh, really a pandemic lens. It's the fact that we have, we're, we're, we're kind of still maybe in the late middle. I mean, are, are we close to the end? I don't know. Uh, God bless us all. There's a pandemic going on. And that if you're not cognizant of the serious nature of the, 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 the way things are in the world right now, the concerns and fears that are legitimate amongst a certain group of people who are want to listen to you about library shaped solutions to problems that are hitting America, New Jersey, your part of Jersey, your, your, your specific school or town, that they want to have a conversation about library shaped solutions and librarian enacted solutions to these problems. And if you're looking to, to tell just a story about how nice you are, they are not gonna look at you as a serious actor. And serious actors, first and foremost, are capable of co-creating a future where solutions are provided. They're, they're capable of asking for support to seize an opportunity or avert a crisis. And those people who are concerned or full of fear are not uh, to be pandered to. All right, that's one set of vectors, how people are wired. Besides the politics, there's those kinds of ways. Let's talk about politics again for a moment though that if we are right at every library in our thesis that all political, uh, that all conversations about funding libraries are fundamentally political because it's about taxes. All right, great. How do people behave in political spaces to show up for the party, to show up for the uh, candidate? The, the idea that um, whenever we take a library to the ballot and we, we set our 121st election day on December 11th, uh, it was with New Orleans. It was to renew the uh, New Orleans Public Library levy uh, for 20 years. We won. It was over 70% of the vote. Uh, it's responsible for 54% of their budget. It was about $17 million potentially on the ballot. And if they had, if they had lost, we would have a real problem in 2022 because the authorization to tax ends, uh, that this authorization ends on the 31st of December. So I'm glad that we passed. And what we know very clearly in campaigns like that and in other ones that we've worked around the country is that the librarians are themselves, the library workers are themselves, an answer to the question of who's gonna spend my money and fundamentally are the candidates in the race. And the library itself, well, we're gonna renew the library's levy for 20 years. You know, the, the where's my money gonna go conversation about how are they gonna put the money to work realizing their strategic plan, doing the mission, vision and values. Fundamentally, the library is the incumbent in the race. Sometimes the library is the insurgent in the race, but that's a whole other thing. We'll talk about that some other time. But when it's politics, how do people look at candidates? How do people look at ideals? They look at it based on the shared value system. Does that candidate or does that campaign, does that set of ideals express my beliefs as well? Does it resonate with me? And if it does, and then also what's the identity together? Are we capable of coming together as perhaps in your community or on your campus or your K-12 context, are we capable of having a shared identity that looks like the library party? Is it like the library party in town? If this was some parliamentary democracy in a small European country, could we run a library party candidate and, and get them elected? It would be like, uh, you know, the library party would have one seat, the Greens would have like three, you know, the Democrat Socialists have like 90, the Tories, but, the value system that we share together and the identity that we have about how we want to express it, it, it together in the world. If you look at the books that candidates write, the position papers, but the books, I mean, the next election where we have an open seat for president, nobody's the incumbent, nobody's the, the, the favored. It's a 2016, God bless us all over again. I want the major news out operations to stop polling and to start asking libraries and bookstores what's circulating and what's selling because you know if the book about the candidate's value system 
is something that you love, you hold it to your, your heart and you give it to people you love because you want them to see the light about this candidate. And if you don't, you throw it at the television because it offends your value system. It offends your belief about America, who we should be. It's why we react so strongly. And, and there's other people, perhaps some of you on this conversation today who are like, I don't like doing politics because it makes me, makes me upset. And it makes other people upset. I'm not suggesting for a moment that we want to start making folks upset inside the library space. The library party needs to be built on a, on a hope for the future, but it is as powerful as that. So politics here, this is from a book called The Political Brain by a guy named Drew Weston. Again, if you like these kinds of political things, read it, not before bed. The personal characteristics of a candidate and the specific policies that a candidate or a party has are a lot less impactful. In fact, there should be like a giant space between values and identity before you get to those other things. Yeah. All right, there's also another vector here. Besides polit political narratives like progressive, conservative and libertarian, and besides compassion or pride of place or data or concerns, uh, besides the idea that we are in a shared identity framework around the work and um, uh, a shared set of values, supporters fundamentally stratify um, in, in, in a concentric circles away from library and librarian. They stratify, by the way, for any issue or cause. This could be about saving whales. This could be about the fight for 15. This could be about the NRA, Second Amendment. It could be about the First Amendment when you get right down to it around what some of the challenges that are happening. At the center of the conversation is the institution of library and those folks who are librarians and library workers. And the next ring out is the relational supporters, folks who know the work, either personally or intimately, or have some sort of a strong identification, perhaps based in personal experience or nostalgia. They are not that many of them. They're the ones who at a cocktail party, you're like, oh my gosh, I can actually talk to you about the work I do instead of the work you do, because they seem to care about librarians and library workers. They seem to know things in a crisis or in an opportunity. Uh, well, actually, they'll come out if you connect with them properly in a crisis or in an opportunity. They'll be your first long-term allies in an advocacy campaign. They're with you 364 other days of the year, too, and there's not a ton of them, and there never will be. They're the core of the library party, though, in your community, on your campus, in K-12. The next ring out, though, are folks who are ideologically aligned with the work you do in the institution that you staff, the department that you run. The ideological supporters have points of common cause or common concern that are, um, uh, they need to have some dots connected for them, though. They drive by the library. They're satisfied that the parking lot is full. They think everything's fine. They like the idea of literacy. They, they like the idea of infrastructure about learning or support for people looking for work. They, they, they feel satisfied that the work that you're doing, in, in, in the absence of information, they feel satisfied that the work that you're doing is good and noble, but you might not be their first point of intersection with a value system. You've got to educate and orient them. And that's even goes for, for activism. They'll be with you over the long haul, though, once they understand the commonalities, the alignments, the common cause and the common concern. The next ring out, folks, is aversionary supporters. These are the people who form the core of our activism campaigns, along with the relational supporters who feel that they have a political voice. Ideological supporters don't show up for, for activism. They show up for advocacy. They like co-creating over the long term. Aversionary supporters are like, why are we going to screw this up? What the hell is going on in town? What good money after bad? Let's not do this wrong. And they are very interested in avoiding bad outcomes based on the principles and ideals that they might share with librarians and library workers if they'd only heard from you before. There was a crisis. They're the people who say to you, if I had only known, I would have helped. And they're interested in helping. They legitimately are. There's a lot more of them. They're gonna be with you for a short amount of time on specific activities. They won't abandon you if you don't abandon them. 
but they're, they're where our activism lives as opposed to our advocacy, which is our friends in the ideological supporter category, and of course, relational supporters as well. The fourth kind of political supporter, idealistic supporter, um, campaign supporter, idea or ideal supporter is that last ring out, the, the access supporters. In politics, it's people who are looking to spend $10,000 a plate to have dinner with uh, Mr. Trump or, or Ms. Clinton or whomever. And in libraries, there's not a lot of them. Unfortunately, if any of you have $10,000 plate friends organizations, I would love to talk to you about how you did that. But fundamentally, access supporters are folks who are the ones who are going to want to be, well, they want the sign in their front lawn that says a library champion lives here. A library lover lives here. A, uh, a library, uh, they wear a button, they got a bumper sticker, they, they, they buy your swag from your store and they carry around tote bags. They're awesome folks. And they're not necessarily going to do any more than that. And part of their access is also to make them into donors and the volunteers because they want to be close to the issue, but they're never going to get loud, noisy, and they're not going to contribute to a long-term co-creation advocacy campaign either. That's fine. I forgive them all. In fact, each of these have strengths and each of them has sincere deficits yeah. about how they, they, they can be put to work on our issues. All right. I got a lot of lists here for you because I owe you good information so that you can reflect deeply on how you're currently communicating. I, I, I owe you good information because if I'm talking about a theory of change and a, a change management approach around advocacy and activism, then I've got to give you the data and the information, the insights, um, because otherwise all I'm doing is just saying, uh, it's not quite working right for the last, I don't know, 25 to 150 years. Let's do it different. Here's how we do it different, folks, is an understanding in terms of our storytelling. And I said earlier that stories won't save us, but stories are the only way that we can communicate as humans. But just simply telling a story and expecting somebody else to fix your problems doesn't work. There are two reasons to give you money. And there are two other reasons here in storytelling to affirm the idea that money should be given. One reason to get, well, there's three reasons to give you money. One reason that they give you money right now is inertia. They've been giving you money for a while in, this, in the city budget. This, the, they've been funding your positions in K-12 or on campus. It's inertia. That's not very comfortable to me. The other reason. The other two reasons to give you money are mutually exclusive. You have a story of success that demonstrates your competency and you can either scale up your success. We have 27 kids who come to story time on Tuesdays. We need to have 50. We need the funding to do 50. We only have uh, funding right now to do 25. And we sneak two more kids in. We want to scale up our success in story time or in ELL work or support for kids who are the first generation going to college or we want to replicate our success. Hey, we do 50 story times on Tuesday, like, like, a, like gangbusters. We want to do the same thing for seniors. We want to do the same kind of outreach because we're competent at it. You should give us new money to do that. We're great with uh, ELL. We want to do it with maker spaces now. We're fantastic when it comes to helping uh, students with uh, individual discovery, but we're a little bit behind the curve right now on our, our uh, work for um, research because our, we don't have our database contracts properly funded. And for Library Link New Jersey, we've been fantastic with our ability to serve our members, and yet we know that we can take it to the next level. To scale or to replicate success is one of only two reasons to give you money besides inertia. The other reason is stories of failure that you are able to talk to, 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 to demonstrate that you have the integrity to fix the failure or avert the failure from happening. We know right now, because we can only get 27 kids in, in, in the, uh, the space, uh, un and unless we receive the funding that we need, uh, we cannot fix systemic intergenerational problems that are driven by early childhood literacy that's promulgated across their lives. We see a problem coming because of the way that workforce in our community is shifting. Uh, the pandemic has disrupted X, Y, or Z. We know it's going to happen. We already see it's starting to manifest. It's nothing that we've ever been responsible for before, but we have the integrity and the competency 
at our library, in our library program uh, here on campus to make sure if we're properly resourced that we can either avert or address. I don't know another reason to give you money except to scale up your success or for you to be able to be the one to fix failures. Except of course for inertia. And if you got a fourth one, I'd love for you to tell me because I'm trying to work my way around how else do we talk about ourselves? Yes, this third, the fourth story, sorry, the third story on this screen is of course the stories about people we care about. We love telling stories about people we care about or the community that we love. You know, the, the compassion or the pride ones. Um, and those are great, but they're not the reason to give you money. No offense, everybody in town, everybody on campus, and everybody in K-12 has got a great story about helping people or, or making place happen. It's the particulars of your success as a library and a librarian group, particulars of how you have the integrity as a librarian, a bunch of library workers to fix or avert failure that drives money conversations. And then the other fourth one is always a good one to have in your back pocket because when you're talking to folks who are potential funders, either political funders or, or philanthropic funders, uh, why you do what you do is where common cause is rooted because they're not librarians. They're not library workers. They're not running a, a library program in the school. They're not running a library program on campus. They're educators. They're, they're, they're educational stakeholders, they're community stakeholders. They would like to know what makes you tick. They, they would like to know who you are and what makes you tick. You're a little hidden from them. But fundamentally, our, we are either competent or we have the integrity to be properly funded. All right, I'm gonna run through two playbooks for you. Uh, and then I'm going to take you through just a couple of thought pieces, and then we're going to open up the floor to chat. I think we're in a good spot here in terms of timing. Activists, again, this is activists. This is not advocacy. This is the truth of activism for any issue or cause, especially libraries of any sort. The principles behind activism is on identifying, cultivating, and empowering supporters who have those different ways of listening those different potential ways of being wired politically, who have different uh, reasons to resonate with your storytelling about success or, or fixing failure, extending success or fixing failure, who have themselves different supporter profiles. I think I did the math properly at some point, but I might be wrong. Um, I think there's 256 ways that somebody can support you. If you take all that, all those, all those four, fours and threes and put them together, the Cartesian product of our conversation this morning, I think is 256, but I might need to go back and do the math different because I did add the politics stuff in. It might even be more than that. And I'm not suggesting that you have to have 256 conversations ready to go, but if you're looking to identify, cultivate and empower supporters for a particular need that you have, a crisis that you want to avert or an opportunity you want to seize, we have to be that sophisticated. Because the points of intersection are not going to be about use ever when it comes to an activist. The you will get or you will lose aspects of things here. If it's about shared values for the community or for people, if it's about an identity as people who care about other people or about the place we live, the campus that we that we're, we're in college, go Tigers. There's not a lot that resonates with it with more than a, you will get, you will lose personally. No, no. What's going to happen to those people? What's going to happen to our place? What's going to happen if we have a deficit? Most people, according to Pew, the Pew Research Center a few years ago, they did the big survey about libraries. Most people are like, you know what I do at the library? I get stuff. At the library, the public library, I go get stuff. I get books, I get other stuff. I like it, it's nice, I get stuff. But <clears throat> what, does the what do the librarians do? They do noble things, like help people find work, stand in gaps, uh, uh, you know, on the edge of the literacy precipice. Activism has to allow and ask for action. Otherwise, it's marketing. Otherwise, it's advertising. 
unless you direct people to do something on your behalf, it's just, I got another small list for you here of things that people are willing to spend. In fact, I need to put up another slide about this one specifically because there's only three types of budget that any human being wants to put into an activism campaign or an advocacy campaign for that matter. They would like to spend money doing it from their own personal budget as a donor. They would like to donate because and here at Every Library, we've got thousands of donors around the country who want to be part of our network who say, hey, uh, you guys, you're doing great work. Here's some money. Keep doing good work. Here's some money for my taxes for public libraries or for, for, for K-12 or from some, some universities. Sure, do the good work. But really, here's my, here's my $5. Don't screw up or please support summer reading. Or here's my 50. Here's my 500 here. I just put you in my will. That budget that they have as a donor is distinct from a budget that people have as a volunteer. Uh, a volunteer uh, or the, the chance to be able to uh, show up and lend their time, if not their treasure, lend their talents, if not their treasure. Yeah, those are like for my own children uh, at school, they, they have, they're in band. We, we sell things apparently to fund public education, like seed packets or or, or wrapping paper or chocolate. And I'm always like, I don't wanna walk around the neighborhood selling seed packets or, or, or get my sister-in-law to subscribe to a magazine. I'm like, can I just cut you guys a check? There's different budgets that people have. Time, volunteerism, I get it. Some people like it. In fact, a lot of you do it. Donors. And then the other is the doer out there. The person who's gonna become an activist, who's gonna put their good name budget behind you. They, they, they say, I would like to check a box, sign a petition, send an email. I, I want to show up. I want to have my name on the letterhead. I want to be part of the committee that's co-creating a future in my community, in our campus, on our K-12 environment, because we share a common set of values. I'm going to show up. And we have to give them pathways to do it. The principles of activism fundamentally you get the slide, Ralph's got the slide, he's gonna send the slides out to everybody. In fact, I got a couple extra bonus slides for you in this section. You should take a look at them when they come out because these are the principles that if you need an activism campaign to happen, you have to be cognizant of building the digital infrastructure for and willing to take the effort to empower in order to get things done over the long term and it's just a one and done. We do this kind of work every day at every library for free, pro bono, for public library, school library, all the time. And I'd be happy to work with you to put it to work to seize opportunities or avert crises. Again, money, their time, or their good name. And unless there's something to do for an activist, it's just marketing. And marketing or advertising is marketing and advertising. If it doesn't have an ask, it's not activism. All right, advocacy principles again, and we're gonna come around to Q&A in just a few moments. Um, conversations about the particulars and the peculiars of your community, your campus, your K-12. I'm, I'm ready for it. It's gonna be interesting, I hope. Oh, by the way, we're gonna use the chat box or we can go on mic if you raise your hand. So if you've got a chat going on, put it in the chat. Ralph's gonna pay attention for me. Advocacy principles. Excuse me. Because advocacy is a long-term co-creation between folks who've got um, a common vision or a common hope or a common cause or a common concern for a population, we have to remember that in advocacy, nothing is personally related to use. Nothing is related to personal use of the library. It's all about the value system about how we put a small amount of smart tax money to work in our community, how we are empowering education in our K-12 setting, how we're moving our universities and colleges and community colleges forward, and the students who are going there perhaps for the first generation ever. Tomorrow marketing is great. You have to do it. I'm not suggesting you don't do it. Thursday, 10 a.m. story time, bring your kids. Has to be done by public libraries. Come to the club that's meeting at the, at the school library. Uh, we're going to talk about civics or something like that. On campus, what do we have for you at the library 
that advances not only your studies, but your, but your own personal development as a young adult, come to the thing on Thursday, 10 a.m. And there's only a small inventory of people who are eligible and interested and available at 10 a.m. on Thursday for that particular program. And that's fine. That's, that's wonderful. If we're going to be talking about value systems, they get activated. If we're going to be talking about a shared identity, about co-creating the future that fixes problems or extends success. If we're going to have, we have to be marketing what we did yesterday at our library based on the value system that was being realized or the value system that was being offended. Yesterday, a week ago, last month, this, in this last year, we had 50 kids a week for story time. We should have had 150. We had 50 kids for story time. We, we, we are realizing our value system to the maximum. We also want to do that same value system in other parts of our society besides, K, besides early childhood. Our value system is being bolstered by wonderful stories with data attached for certain ways that people listen. When we, we did this great stuff yesterday, you don't have kids. You're not available at 10 a.m. You don't even like children, but let's talk about the systems that are in place to support a learning community or the love of re whatever it is. The yesterday parts of it are more important when you're talking about advocacy than anything else, because nobody's going to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a high level donor here. I, I need that, that personal uh, touch when it comes to learning how to use a mouse or Excel. No. Coalitions are the core to any of your advocacy campaigns. Coalitions are the core, and that's a whole other thing. Folks, here at every library, pro bono for free. I'm not for hire. You can't hire us. We don't, we don't take any money from your library. Or, you, you, I mean, certainly from your school libraries. Who's going to pay us? The, the, <clears throat> if you want to have this conversation in a deep way for your particular place, whether you're looking to do a Johnson Amendment bill, I'm sorry, Johnson Amendment uh, campaign to raise your mill rate in town, um, or if you're looking to fix problems because your city council is so disconnected from what you're doing and there's just nothing but inertia funding you. Folks, these long co-creation stories or conversations are something that we support all the time. And I want to break you out of your shell and find those coalition partners who, like you, also care. You are the only expert, by the way, in library work and as a result, you are, well, partially, you know, it's kind of, you're kind of alone until you find those commonalities. Um, and people want to have the dots connected for them. The ideology-driven uh, folks definitely want to have the, uh, the dots connected for them. But also, uh, this might sound weird, but you are the only expert in librarianship and libraries in your community, in your K-12 environment, or on your campus. So you have the burden of not just talking about wonderful things that are happening, but you also have to define the negative. What happens if you don't do the work? What happens if you're absent? Uh, folks will believe you if you're showing up with your integrity and your competencies, and they need to hear it from you directly. Likewise, storytelling will not save us in advocacy any more than in activism because we have this problem where we are looking to have somebody other than us, other than the only expert in town or on campus or in your K-12 environment, the only expert, the authentic expert, tell the, their own story about, I did this work and we need these resources. We keep trying to find proxies for our advocacy and our activism. Gosh, I hope somebody else shows up and testifies on my behalf. They'll testify if you ask them to but they need to hear from you directly. And the policymakers out there need to hear from you directly as well. Likewise, no one is gonna solve your budget or policy issue for you because you told them a great story about helping some kid learn to read or building community. You actually have to become in an advocacy context, not just a, um, the expert that you already are in libraries and librarianship. You might also have to become a forensic accountant. Why isn't the city why isn't our school board, why isn't the chancellor's office allocating the proper resources so we can do our jobs best? That's an accounting function. That's understanding how government money works and then rewriting the budget for the future that you seek. 
again, we do this kind of work all the time at every library. Happy to help you. You can reach out anytime, pro bono for free. Marketing tomorrow is about use. Marketing yesterday is about talking in a common cause, common concern, shared values, aligned mission, common vision for the future way about what a small amount of smart tax money does to fuel the common good. And you got to market both of those. You got to spend a little bit of money to, to do regular building use, yes, and telling the, the, the wonderful common story. All right, who else cares? Pardon me. Who else cares about your stories? Again, your particular context, public library, school library, university, college, community college library, there's a lot of places of alignment for long-term advocacy campaigns who are ready to listen about a co-creation. It's gonna be particularly and peculiar to your place. And um, I'd like to help. We also have, um, two techniques that I want to just put a bug in your ear about. We're in December. If you've already started your annual report, great. If you haven't started your annual report, this is now you know part of your, your time to potentially do it. Your strategic plan, if you're working on one, your building plan. Folks, I was on the library board for my own library here in suburban Chicago, Berwyn, Illinois. Uh, for eight years, I was board president for six years. We did two strategic plans and I wish we had done what I know now then. And that would be to title our strategic plan, our building initiatives, uh, what they really were, which was, it takes a village with the Berwyn Public Library at the middle of it. Um, it is a dreams from my hometown public library. It is make Berwyn, Illinois great again. In fact, those books that I was talking about that you either embrace to your, to, to your heart or you throw at the television set, uh, those, that's fundamentally folks, what you're, what you're doing with, your live public library strategic plan, your school libraries plan a service for education, your college, university, community colleges approach to realizing the academic mission of your campus and your 2021 annual report. If the title of it is simply 2021 annual report, I'm just gonna shake my head because I haven't gotten through it all, have I? For staff, there's a staff exercise that we would do together to surface your own values, vision, and mission personally and collectively. Because again, that's the point of intersection with folks who are not librarians on campus, in K-12 contexts, and in communities. What builds an awareness that you have a common value system, a shared mission, and a, set, and a vision for tomorrow together is to be expressing it yourselves. I do this work we need these resources. Together, we can co-create a future for those people we care about in this community we call home. Folks love to talk about plan A. What happens if, it, if we get the money? But folks also need to talk about plan B. And again, as the expert, what happens if you are funded properly to co-create that future? What happens uh, if, if the uh, asteroid is nudged away from destroying the library? What happens if it hits? What's plan B? What, what happens if we don't get the funding? All right, Ralph, I wanna invite people to, uh, to chat here, to talk a little bit, to use the chat box, uh, to put this into, into practice uh, for your individual libraries and for Library Link New Jersey community. How do you want me to do that? Should we, should we go back to a full gallery here? That might be a good uh, way to do this. We had a couple uh, comments from Mary Moyer Stubbs. We just want to oh, Mary, some, some examples of activism here. You may want to take a look at the chat. Yep, uh, I got to call um, out in JSL for extraordinary work on their policy framework, uh, both for their their information literacy bill as well as for advancing the mandate bill and um, for showing up for individual school librarians and districts um, during moments of crisis. Um, they are doing extraordinary work. I am proud of our, of our relationship with NJSL and the support that we're able to provide from every library for their, for their digital platforms on Save School Librarians, as well as the friendly opportunities to kibitz a little bit about strategy. So, all right, folks, I can take more in the chat. Let me open it up. Uh, or you can go on mic if you'd like.
keeping an eye out for raised hands. I'm not seeing any yet. That's all right. Um, Actually, I just unmuted Ralph. So, John, it's sure. Jean Marie Ryan. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Nice to talk to you today. Always. So, I think I what resonated with me the most about what you said is this call for action from people. So I'd like to hear your guidance on what you would suggest that the 104 people on this meeting do when we get off this meeting to further advocacy in the state of New Jersey. Sure, sure. The um, to be honest about your uh, um, to be honest together about what uh, will be your biggest challenge that isn't focused on funding but is focused on audience identification and segmentation. Um, the public library community has a, a different set of, of issues than the school library community does and, and the college and university library does as well as this particular library link and the other systems, the state library's budget, the whole thing, each of them is particular and peculiar, but where are you folks falling short in terms of either political conversations or falling short as a community of libraries? You know, from the outside, y'all look kind of the same. No offense. I mean, I'm not a librarian by trade. I don't have an MLS. I've never worked in a library. You look at the library community from the outside. I look at it the same way I look at it, like healthcare. I'm like, look at this healthcare, you know, but then you start learning more about it. You understand the different aspects of it. Um, from the outside, how do you break through your isolation in terms of coalitions and visibility? Um, the, the biggest things that you folks can do, I think, is to caucus those, those common uh, needs, again, the particulars of your budgets, the particulars of your structures across public, school, academic, special, state, et cetera, are not what I'm talking about here. It's, are we missing a, a whole tranche in a political way and how do we reframe library and library work? Um, or are we isolated and we need to break out into coalitions that are focused on systems that will solve some of our problems, not with broad sweeping strokes, but by getting to know folks who also run other parts of society, who are running other parts of education, who are running other parts of government. And I, I'm from Chicagoland, so it's never generally, the, it's always no small plans over here, you know? Hey, Chicago, New Jersey, and Louisiana, John, the most corrupt places in the good old United States of America. I completely agree with you. And the work that we were doing in New Orleans and the work that I'm doing with New Jersey warms my heart because it, it, I, I think I kind of understand it a little bit. But I think you sort of hit on what I was hoping you'd say to everyone, but I wanted a specific action call for every individual on this call. And mm -hmm. I was hoping you were going to say what I say to them often. So I'm hoping you'll get there individually. What can each person on this call do this afternoon? Well, I would like what to. What would be a good first step before we build these broad coalitions? Because I live by Tip O'Neill's words that all politics is local. So what mm -hmm. can every individual on this Zoom meeting do today? <sighs> Fundamentally. If the librarian is the candidate in the race, if the librarian is the, the leader of the cause, locally, across the state, nationally, if the, the library worker, the librarian has that role, I would never send any candidate out on Meet the Press uh, to talk to the local newspaper to do a stump speech without being prepared properly. I would suggest that you, the, the, the thing that everybody has to do before you take the next bold step is to get yourselves uh, properly literate about the politics of your local community or your campus and properly financially, politically literate and financially literate. If you're asking to, for somebody to do something that's unavailable by law, for example, we have this problem in library advocacy and the mushy part of advocacy and activism before for this program today, um, where we're like, hey, librarians are great. Uh, school librarians are wonderful. Put them, you know, give, give, give us funding, member of Congress, and that there's no authorization for that. There's no authorization for the next round of your construction, you know, 
bond, if there's no authorization or way under the city council to give you more than, than three, or if it's impossible to do it, if you're in a place that's broke, and I mean politically broken or financially busted, and you're asking for something that's not possible right now, I, I really do think that it's on us to become politically savvy, politically literate about wh where power flows in our communities, on our campuses in our K-12, and financially literate as well about where the sources of money are. You know, not just the idea that, that, that because we have to be able to solve those problems alongside and with those folks who are in positions where, who are in positions to fund us. Thank you so much, John. That's exactly what I was looking for. I was suggesting that everybody on the call get off the call and go home and look around at who the players are in your community. Mm -hmm. And that could be your local council. It could be your school board. It could be your assembly people and your state senators. <laughs> It could be your federal government representatives, but we need to know who the players are before we can build those relationships with them. It's, it, it, is, it, it is about uh, that, uh, exactly. All right, John, we got a couple yeah. things in the chat here. Ralph, what's on your mind there? Well, we have uh, Juliet from NJLA well, hey, next with her hand up. Hey, John, great presentation. Thank you, Ralph. Um, I want to piggyback on um, Jean Marie's question that um, you also answered. And I will add to that, that part of our homework could very well be to take that slide from your presentation about how people listen. And when you do your homework about who are the players, I will suggest that we go further to find out how each of those players listen. And from that, begin to build a framework for outreach and building those relationships that are critical to our success. Um, but that was not my question. I know you and I had a good conversation at the NGESO conference. Can you talk to us about if we were to articulate training based on some of the items you shared in your presentation today, what will that training look like? Um, so that there are several politically focused techniques to understand um, or to anticipate where the audiences are on the other side of a potential conversation that I'd wanna be able to do as a training program um, there's a, a message box exercise. Again, if we don't know, and we're just making some assumptions going in uh, to any advocacy or activism conversation, that's all we've got. Uh, then what we have to do is do very good homework to anticipate. Um, so understanding uh, who is on the other side of the conversation, what they believe about libraries, uh, understanding uh, through uh, uh, speculation on our part, informed speculation with a hypothesis, also doing good research on what they say about themselves. Because our common points, for example, around K-12 uh, and school libraries um, isn't about school librarianship. It's about what are their, what's their value system around education. So how do you reverse engineer basically? So the, the trainings that, that go on um, would be separate um, at a certain point between type of library, but the beginning of the training is fundamentally, how do you um, anticipate uh, and research and then reframe based on the understandings that there's differences between political filters, types of supporters, et cetera. So it's a lot of home, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of, it's a lot of, it's a lot of writing actually. But it's good work because then you're able to um, anticipate success, rehearse uh, the conversations that you're going to have, and um, the pathway to, to leave your building either for a local action or for a statewide action or even a federal action um, is then uh, done based on those concentric circles about who's closest to you. you know, so we can have a really great experience, Juliet. Thank you. Thank you. John, we have one more question from Laverne Mann at the Cherry Hill Public Library in chat here. We may yeah. need to, I guess, wrap it up. 
at sure. this point. Let's sure. So Laverne, uh, uh, through the combined effort of years in NJLA, especially the Public Policy Committee, we've had some success in New Jersey with increasing the per capita construction funding. How do we engage with librarians and library directors who do not uh, do not do advocacy or activism? Laverne, that's a great question. And hi, nice to, nice to see you today. Um, and yes, the NJLA uh, advocacy um, milieu has been has been really well done. Um, I mean, honestly, the construction bill and the Johnson bill, I mean, amazing. You might have some folks who are uh, library directors, uh, library leaders who are otherwise not interested or capable. Now, I'm not saying that's you, Laverne, you're, you're, you're very capable. But one thing that I would do, as I said before, about not wanting to put anybody out on Meet the Press or interview with a local newspaper or, or do a stump speech or even get up in front of the Rotary Club, um, that part of our respect for each other politically um, and socially within this organic community of library leaders in, in New Jersey um, is to say, honestly, I don't want to do that work in particular. Um, I'm not going to be good at it. I'll lean into the trainings, but if I go through the training and it doesn't spark it for me, I'm going to not put myself in a position that's incorrect for me. However, I will do something that is correct for me because we need not just politically literate and savvy individuals, we need that financial literacy component. We need people who are good at marketing because so far, you know, we're, I mean, we have people who are, are, are specialists. There's enough of you in the library leadership in New Jersey, across public, school, academic, special, et cetera, that um, I think that we could build a very good bench without an expectation that everybody is the candidate. I'm looking for a few people to be chief of staff as well. Great. Thank you, John. Absolutely. Yeah. So folks, nice to see you in the chat. I want to acknowledge Bonnie's um, uh, comment here, but also you know, let her know that I, I did get home safe, obviously, <laughs> from, from and Jason. You know, thank you for that. Um, Kathy, thanks for making a comment here. Ava, you too. Um, you know, Eileen, I'm with you. So folks, as your day progresses, I'm gonna be here in the background. I'm gonna, I was joking with Ralph before, I'm gonna leave the the, the feed on and on here's some of these re reports and these conversations as, as you're moving forward. I said it was going to be probably one of the, the most uh, esoteric NPR shows I will ever listen to, you know, but I'm actually really interested. So, all right, team, anything else in your mind, Ralph? We're good. We're good. Thank you so much, John. Um, I, I, with everybody, you know, let's give uh, John a virtual round of applause here. Oh, that's uh, nice. And thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And, um, you know, I want to mention that John's presentation, he's uh, agreed to allow us to record this. So we will be posting this presentation up on our YouTube uh, site. And we can also help you get in. If you have any questions for him, um, we can help you get in touch with him. So, that sounds fantastic, Ralph. Great. Okay, team. Thank you. Be well today. Thank you. Thank you.